Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code FRAMERATE6. Frame Rate episode 29. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood. And it's good to be back right in the frames. Uh, yeah, although, you know, you're back in the saddle right in the studio. You're on your A game location. I'm in our East Coast studios here at the Anime Con studio, courtesy of one P. Delahante from the chat room. Big, big thanks to Patrick for letting us crash and steal his bandwidth, you which does? is 100% reliable and I'm told will never, ever crap out. Are you, are you there, Brian? Are, are you there? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. His bandwidth is me? totally 100% reliable. <laughs> I think he fell for it. No, no. You're, you're... <laughs> ah! I cursed us. <laughs> so, uh, Brian, what were you saying about the bandwidth there? Uh, I was saying, I was just telling it like it is, Merritt. It'll never, ever go out. And it'll never... It's, it's as though his, his bandwidth has, like, a sense of humor. Because we started the show... And then right as I introduced myself, it crapped out. This is after like 20 minutes of everything fine. And then I announced that everything will go totally fine and I get the treatment again. Yes. Okay. Well, let's just move on then to the big story, shall we? Here we go. Still there, Brian? Yes, I am. Okay, good. This just ends Still with the you. big story. Now, this just broke mere hours before we uh, started recording frame rate, uh, even hours before the first three times we started recording frame rate. <laughs> Hulu is apparently considering selling itself for money uh, so on a street corner like a whore. <laughs> like a whore. <laughs> or like an NBA player. I mean, look, those guys sell their bodies just the same. Let's not make judgments on Hulu. Julia, Julia Burston from CNBC on Twitter says, sources tell me Hulu was approached with a buyout offer. No decisions have been made, in all caps. Uh, and then separately, Anuprita Das from the Wall Street Journal, Hulu is weighing whether to sell itself after a potential buyer approached it with an offer. Sources, story to follow. See, it used to be sources familiar with the matter. Now on Twitter, you just have to say sources. Yeah, you don't have enough room for uh, sources familiar with the matter, so you only get a couple of dashes. But the Wall Street Journal article is up, but it really doesn't say anything else than those Twitter <laughs> posts, to be honest, which is apparently Hulu's been approached by a potential buyer and nobody wants to say who it is yet. Well, and, 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 although in the Wall Street Journal article, Brian, it does quote people familiar with the matter. Okay, good. Because nowadays on Twitter, they just shorten it just to the word sources. They don't even give you sources familiar with the matter or anything. Right. But uh, the, uh, and the, and you can as... find that story on peoplefamiliarwiththematter.com. Do they really? Is that, is that an aggregator that does? Yeah, I'm, I'm, that I'm, that? I made that site. That's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, oh, but the, here's the important thing is so Netflix has, I'm sorry, Hulu hasn't said anything. And 
all, all this happened is someone said, hey, Hulu, nice site. You want to sell it? And then that's it? Like, are, are, they, are they really considering and for what? How much for the website? I, know. I want well, your website. Sell them to me. Uh, uh, it's, who would buy it is what we were talking about on Tech News Today. And the only even slightly reasonable, although still far out there, uh, option would be Facebook. Oh, that's way out there. Well, yeah. but Facebook wants to integrate uh, music and video into their website. So that is the only one where I'm like, well, they might want to buy You know Hulu. what? Actually, that could be the perfect match because what Facebook needs is more things to do in a social way. And what Hulu needs is more community. Uh, I, I could totally see that. that exactly. It, it's, it is a stretch, like you say, but it's the only one where like, well, okay, but I, I could see it working. I can't see but Microsoft Hulu, Hulu buying. isn't even profitable at this point, is it? No, although they were getting close to an IPO and then they backed off. So this is the right time to buy them if you are going to buy them. I just don't know who would buy them other than Facebook. Well, and, and, what, uh, like, and they've said, oh, and we should say, Wall Street Journal has reported Google is not one of the suitors. They've ruled Google yeah. out. Google has said, no, we're not interested in, in Hulu. Yeah, well, and, and that makes sense as well. So if you're going to say, if, if they are going to sell, uh, what, what do you think the valuation would be at? Like, I mean, not that, not that we're experts in any oh, stretch really? when it comes to this kind of thing. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, are we talking like, uh, like you, you know, YouTube money or Netflix money or... I wouldn't even know where to begin to calculate that. I think, uh, you know what, breaking news, we can confirm that it will be more than one U.S. dollar. This just in. Probably be more than one Canadian. Maybe, wait, which one is more right now? Uh, this is an unsolicited offer, too. Don't forget. Uh, they, and that's, that's somebody the, just walked point. up to the bo Hulu's board and said, you know, we'd like to buy it. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, I don't know. It's like, and, and so it could be one of those things. This sounds like such a joke. I, don't, I, I just don't see this. Uh, but do you think it would be good? Because, for instance, Comcast won't have the ability to approve this because they don't have board members anymore. Uh, that was a that was a a uh, condition of them being able to acquire NBC was that NBC would give up their board members on Hulu, but they still own an interest in it. And I could see Comcast running behind the scenes saying, yeah, sell. We, we don't want these restrictions that are on us from Hulu anymore. Well, what about, what about, could it be one of the big uh, broadband suppliers buying it with the intention of, you know, one of these cable companies either trying to diversify their- Well, what if Comcast position? was going to buy it so That's, they'd- it's, but they'd still have the restrictions. They, they, they couldn't have NBC on the board. It wouldn't make any sense. Just because okay. of the restrictions the FCC not, put on. Not even if they wanted to buy it to screw it up? Maybe a Time eliminate. Warner or somebody like that. Well, I mean, because uh, like at this point, I mean, as, as we'll discuss more later, people really are who are cutting the cord. We're starting to see for the first time people turning off their television in their living room to watch video on, on TV or on their, on their computer. Could it be the kind of thing where it's like, well, let's buy it and then we can, you know, mismanage it a bit and make it go away yeah actually that we might as well just go to another big story because because that's really where this is leading yeah stop everything it's another big story all right so this broke uh in the middle of last week uh early actually just after frame rate last week a new research from nielsen shows that the more web video you watch the less time you spend on traditional TV, uh, they have a chart showing web video streaming consumption versus TV consumption that maps out quite neatly. So it's not saying that, you know, you're definitely cutting the cord, but as you do start to watch web video, it does eat into your TV time. And a new report from the Diffusion Group surveyed Netflix users. Now, let's, let's remember, we're just looking at people who are already watching Netflix online as it is. But of Netflix users, 32% plan on cutting at least part of their cable bill. Now, there's lots of other uh, numbers in here about this, but what everyone seemed to be taking away with it is it's not about cord cutting. It's what they're calling cord shaving, uh, yes. which, well, you know, these terms get really cute, but it's the idea of it may not kill cable, but it may stop people from buying more expensive packages. Now, I'll tell you this much. That whole business of asking people whether or not they plan to cut their cable services, I'm going to call total shenanigans on because I've been planning to cut the cord for four years now. And the fact is, it's just way, way difficult in most situations to even get close to making that happen. So 
I, I will take that story as a vote of confidence that we all intend to cut the cord, but practically it's still way, way difficult for but people do you, to do But do you it. think it's more likely that people say, I'm planning on cutting back my service, or people saying, I'm planning on cutting my service, will then cut back their service, even if they don't cut it all the way? I think there's a tremendously large gap between what people say they intend to maybe do and what actually ends up happening. And you're talking to a guy who, when I moved, I thought, this is it, I'm going to go without cable. I was like, fine, I'll get the bare minimum so my kids can have Nickelodeon. And now here I am a year later, and guess who now has the premium everything package just because I wanted to sign up for HBO for Game of Thrones. So it's like, I don't even watch half of these channels, but it's like, hey, you're subscribing for HBO. We throw in Showtime and a million other things free. And I'm yeah, like, but, but that's you and you're, you're not necessarily a representative sample, right? I mean, well, no, but I, I mean, I certainly represent people who want more than anything to cut the cord. And I, I have been the guy in every survey who has announced, I plan to cut the cord. I plan to reduce services. So it's scientifically accurate to predict what will happen in cord cutting based on you and you alone. No, 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 no. I will say, but I will say that uh, that it's um, my my lifetime experience has shown that uh, many people will say they want to do something and then find out that practically it's very difficult. Well, and and I, I, say, I, I agree with that principle, especially with cord cutting, which is more difficult. But I think the idea of what they're calling cord shaving, I think there is probably more likely uh, effect there. I think people will look at that and say, you know what? I don't have to have all of these sports channels. I don't have to have all these movie channels. I'm going to, you know, especially movie channels, right? I'm going to go without those because I want to, I'm just going to use Netflix for that. I, I think that has more of a chance of people being accurate on predicting their own behavior. Now, do you think that this kind of research would cause cable companies to shape their packages in a particular way in order to discourage cord shaving? For I think example, if they see it start to happen, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, make the gap to where it's like you're at that $97 a month range, and you're like, well, I want the lowest thing. You're like, well, the lowest thing is 14 channels, and that's 20 bucks. And you're like, well, I don't want that low. I want to be able to tune into CNN, at least. And then, uh, and then make it to where they, they're like, okay, fine. And then they end up still spending roughly the same or maybe they maybe they'll have some package where it's like a token shaving where it's just like well you could save 10 whole dollars if you eliminate half your channel if they were smart what they would do is they would look at those tv shows that do well on the internet mad men uh all, all of the the stars tv shows the hbo tv shows all that stuff that's popular with the hulu audience and put that in a tier oh and man say, you know what you want to watch the walking dead you got to get this premium tier because uh, I'll tell you, I'll that, tell you what that else. is a way to get people to spend their money. I tell you what else they could also win by winning over some of the functionality of what people love about the Hulu and Netflix experience. Because among other things, like I don't really care whether it's the bandwidth of, in a, of IP distribution or the bandwidth of cable distribution. I just love the ease of selection to get the content that I care about. And I got to tell you, I might even keep my premier too expensive package on Time Warner if they all of a sudden came out with like the premier DVR where it had this TiVo like beautiful in interface, this concierge kind of an experience. Oh, where you mean something like Google TV with Sage TV built in? Exactly that kind of thing. And if it was them offering it, I think it's worth it for them to invest to try to if you if you can't battle Hulu on availability and on demand, at least battle Hulu on ease of use and quality of user experience because I think that's the biggest gap when it comes to living room TV watching experiences. I, I don't ever want to know channels anymore. That's that's like me sitting down and deciding to punch in an IP address to go to yahoo.com well, instead of just and, typing and, it and in. Remember, we're, we're trying to chart the path through a blank space on the map, but we know where the end is. And the end yes. is everything comes over the internet and we get to choose which stuff we watch. It's going Absolutely. to happen. All we're figuring out is what is the meandering path that the industry forces us to take to get to that end point. Uh, and what, the, what these studies are both saying is people are not likely to necessarily ditch their cable, but they're likely to change how they spend their money on it, and I think that's true. And the more web video people watch, the less they watch TV. The less they watch TV, the less likely they're going to want to keep certain tiers of stuff, even if they like what's on it. And there are a lot of people right into frame rate, right into other shows that I do, and say, you know what? Yeah, I used to watch American Idol, and I used to watch Game of Thrones and all these HBO shows, and I just said, why? I get, I forget it. I'll watch them later. I don't have to watch them right now. Uh, and there's, there's people like you and me who get really excited and we're like, no, we have to watch it right now. But there's plenty of people out there that are willing to wait if they don't have to pay the extra money, and so they just get a Netflix subscription, maybe buy a few things on iTunes, 
cobble it together that way, and they're fine with it. They're just like, you know what? Forget it. I'll I'll just I'll just do without some television because honestly, it's not that hard to do. Once you've made the jump, people say, I realize I was watching too much anyway. Well, I'll tell you what else. Uh, now, when it comes to the real-time viewing of television shows, when it comes to certainly newsworthy things, uh, for example, an American Idol thing, especially when you get near the end, if you don't want to have the surprise ruined when you turn on the news in the morning or open up Google News or whatever, I remember back when I cared about the first season of The Apprentice, I remember having a DVR because I was on the road and turned on CNN and I'm like, and as we all know, this jackass won the game. And uh, there seems to be also with fiction, like this sort of cutoff point where it's like, everybody's good about dancing around spoilers until you get to the end of a season or the end of a series. The second that happens, it seems like everybody's allowed to talk about what happened during the last episode. So it's like there are shows, for example, Lost was one I got way behind in, but as we got close to the finale, I made sure to get all the way caught up because I didn't want that case of everybody talking about the end and me not knowing what the heck they're talking about. I guess, I guess that's true, but then I, I'm, I'm talking about people who say, you know, I just don't care about those shows anymore. I mean, are there many? Are there that many people who just don't have a single show that they care about on television? Well, or or they just want to uh, consume stuff in their own manner, in their own way, and since they don't watch television, they don't see the new shows that spoil it. I guess. Now, which which one are we like in our hearts? Because we're we're you know want to do it when we feel like doing it, people, but I'm, we're also people who get so caught up in the story that we want to we want to follow it at the I moment. I've been both. I I I, I have lived a uh, you know long years without cable where I just didn't bother watching television. Wait, I was doing other when, things. When, when did you go when did you go without cable? From 1988 ah. until 1997. I didn't Holy have cable. Cow. Yeah. This is before wow. cord cutting, you know, and watching things I just did other stuff with my time. I just didn't watch television. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you through uh, most of college I, I, I watched same. some broadcast television, but I didn't I didn't watch any cable. Well, that was the big thing. I remember I, I used to get bootlegs of South Park. A friend of mine would record it because he had Comedy Central and I didn't. And he would hand me a tape every so often that I watch. So it's like I've been there. I don't, I don't want to go back necessarily, especially now that I have kids. But, uh, but yeah, it's certainly doable. But I don't, I don't think that's what we're entering right now. I don't know. Maybe among the youngsters, the college students. And, and, and among people who just aren't as into stuff, you know, and they're like, you know, what? I, I want to watch a movie now and again. I don't care about getting caught up with TV shows. I don't think that's a lot of people in the audience, but I think those people exist. Hmm. All right. Let's move on to yet another big story, if needed. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Isn't it pull up your bootstraps? Have we talked about this before? Uh, you know what? I believe it's slap a nun with a bootstrap. Right. It's time for another big story. And that big story is an MMO that is also a television show. Yeah, this is a neat idea. I thought this was really cool. I heard some scuttlebutt about it on E3, and there was a, uh, this is the, the Discovery thing, right? Yeah, well, the, the game is called Defiance. It's been in the works since 2008. Uh, and the idea, very simply put, is it's a story set in future post-apocalyptic version of Earth. The game you play is centered in the remains of San Francisco, while the television show takes place in St. Louis. And since it's an MMO, they both happen in real time. And so you can have character crossover where characters that you know from the MMO leave San Francisco and show up in the show in St. Louis and vice versa. People from the show can come to the MMO. Events that happen in the MMO may affect the storyline in St. Louis and vice versa. But it's a really interesting way of saying we're going to have a game and a television show, but they're not duplicating each other. They're just inhabiting the same universe. Yeah, I wish I could remember the other example that I'd heard of that was similar to this. Um, uh, but I, from what I understood is they, they uh, at E3, the folks who were presenting at this, and I'm, unfortunately this is all third hand because I didn't meet them when I was out there, but what I heard is that they're being very, very delicate about not playing up how tied in the two of them are together. But that, you know, the TV is the TV thing and the MMO is a complement to it was what I heard. Uh, but, but I think it's a great idea. I want to see more crossovers like this. Well, since I'm from the St. Louis area and I live in the San Francisco area, uh, you got me. Oh, yeah. Now, now, what's the story behind the TV show? This is I know it's set in post-apocalyptic. Is this kind of a uh, just a total fiction story? It's a narrative or some kind of reality segment or something? I don't, I don't have any more details than, than just what I've told you so far, which is they're both set yep. in the same world and it's post-apocalyptic and... 
some things will happen in both. Uh, they from from this uh, from this article. From a global standpoint, this could be a large political change, a big environmental change, and they'll happen simultaneously on both. Okay, so is this, um, uh, what would you, what, in your fantasy scenario, is this the kind of thing where, like, you would love to play the MMO and then maybe have an offhanded comment from the characters in St. Louis refer to the, the such and such problem out west and be like, oh, and gee, I was there, I fought that bad guy. Well, yeah, yeah I think... Uh... Some of the things you can do in an MMO involve everyone in the universe having to pitch in, right? Uh, in World of Warcraft, they're called world events. Uh, mm -hmm. And everybody goes and has to do these quests in the world event, and it, and it has a big effect on, on the world. And I could see something like that happening within this storyline that is then carried through in St. Louis. And they're like, yeah, did you hear about the uprising in San Francisco? You know, it, it was or wasn't successful based on how the game goes. That'd be kind of cool. So uh, this also seems like an opportunity to make a lot of hay with some of the secondary characters. Uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, I played the Star Wars customizable card game, basically Magic the Gathering with Star Wars cards. Yeah. And because all the rare cards were the most important characters in the game, the ones that, the ones that you saw a million of were the nobodies in the cantina. But as a result of playing the game a lot, you're like, oh, Momane Don, Hammerhead, he's a vegetarian. You just learn all this weird, this weird stuff. So I wonder if there will be uh, this kind of collection of secondary characters in the big show that are a big deal in the MMO yeah, and vice quite, versa. It's quite possible. But it's a, it's a cool idea uh, for integrating that, that I haven't seen anybody pull off yet, so I hope they do. Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Netflix. You can watch streaming television shows in all different kinds of ways. Uh, movies, TV shows on your Mac, your PC, your iPad, on your iPhone, on your Android phone, on your Xbox, your, your PS3, your Nintendo Wii. Put them right up there on your TV. If you're not a gamer, Apple TV works. Roku box works. So many ways to get Netflix on your television. And then you can watch great TV shows and movies. Uh, but movies like Harry Brown or Pulp Fiction. Uh, I Saw the Devil. Silence of the Lambs. Clerks. Reservoir Dogs. All of these are streaming right now on Netflix. Even, even this, the Star Trek reboot. You just sit down and press play and watch them. Uh, and you so, know what I like about the what I love so much about the Netflix streaming are the movies that you never would have discovered if it weren't for Netflix instant streaming. For example, I saw just now as you scroll down, I saw Beer Wars in there, which is an amazing tale of the uh, the mass monopolization of beer distribution. And then meanwhile, uh, Ponyo up there at the top, my kids, I was just scrolling past it, and my kid was just like, "What's that one? What's that one?" And so I hit play, and uh, they love it. It's their all-time favorite kids movie now, and I never would have discovered it if it weren't for Netflix instant streaming. Even, even getting the DVD, I'd be like, oh, it's so precious, I can only pick one DVD to have come to me, and I wouldn't have picked that one. I would have gone with a safe choice, but because you have nothing to lose but a few minutes of your time, that's what's great about Netflix instant streaming. So here's what you do. If you're already a Netflix customer, you know all this stuff, but if you're not, or if you know of someone who isn't yet, you give them 30 days free, or you take 30 days free on Netflix to try it out. Say, I don't have to believe Brian Brushwood and Tom Merritt. You know, Please don't. they're just, they're crazy people. One of them's got weird hair and the other's got weird hair in his face. I'm not going to believe <laughs> either one of them. I'm going to go to netflix.com slash twit and get 30 days free of Netflix and decide for myself. Be sure to use that URL though, when you sign up, because that helps support frame rate and all the shows of twit. We thank Netflix for their support of twit. We hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. Kind of think you will. So uh, tell a friend, give it a try. We appreciate their support. Shall we move then on to our, uh, which, which one do we do next? Tube Tops or Film Thumb? Film Thumb. Film Thumb. All right. Film Thumb. I love that typeface. You, you, oh, you lie. You, you are, you're pandering to the audience at this point. You are the lone person trashing the, the font. I'll say it's a font. That's what normal people call it. And now you're rolling under. Wait, the size of the typeface is a matter of opinion? The size of the typeface? Yeah, you said font. Oh, oh, all right. Uh, in one of the best measures against piracy to make content uh, more easily available, Warner Brothers is streaming videos in China. Their, Warner Brothers is the first to ink an official video on demand deal, deal called You On Demand, uh, the country's first pay TV service. Yes, and this is definitely a step in the right direction. We've said this on the show before. Not, you know, not that we're, you know, universal experts on this kind of thing. 
But uh, facing reality, if what you want to do is reduce piracy, then what you do is you have to create a viable alternative. And it sounds like the most interesting part of this whole article is that the videos on demand will be roughly what you would spend to buy a pirated copy of it. And now, of course, you don't get to hold on to it. You don't get to sell it afterwards. You don't get to keep it or give it to a friend. But if what you want is to watch something online, because I think uh, uh, what, we, what you discover, much as, as when, um, like from an environmental perspective, once different civilizations reach a certain level of uh, affluency, they tend to take care of their own environmental needs. Likewise, I don't think that everybody wants to screw over the content makers. I think it's just a reality for the pay levels that a lot of people have and the market that's there with the piracy. Hopefully what this will do is give people a, a, an opportunity to actually pay something, even if it's not as much as we would expect here in the West. So good job, Warner Brothers, on uh, taking it to the, the video on demand service in China. Now, uh, now one thing on this, say. one thing in the story that I thought was really interesting was I, they, they get a, a protected monopoly here for a while. Is that correct? Is that right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to look for, I'm not, the word monopoly doesn't show up on there, but it did mention in there that, um, that they get, uh, for some of, they'll be the only provider Oh, and I guess the, the big trouble now is uh, that they're trying to get distribution for everything. Um, you know, I'm trying to find it in here. But, uh, I mean, certainly, I guess... I know, was under the impression that they were just the, the only one who got a deal done, that, that it wasn't a protected thing. There, there, there are other helps, VOD plays right here. underway in the country. It helps that YOD is entering China under a 20-year exclusive contract from the government to run national VOD services. Right. So, so Warner Brothers isn't got a monopoly, but YOD. However, there are other uh, video on demand services already in the country. Docs TV uh, works with NDS to roll out uh, the, you know, the party uh, to push VOD services in specific regions. So I guess uh, YOD gets is the first nationwide one. All right, so here's the question then. Is this just the first brick to fall? Is all of a sudden everybody's going to get in and be like, well, at least let's get something out of China? Well, and I think, yeah, I think all the, when you, if you say everyone by meaning movie studios, yes. Yes. I think everyone's going to watch Warner Brothers a little bit, kind of keep like, eh, how's that deal doing for you? Uh, but then, you know, pretty quickly everybody else will follow. But be my guess. I don't really know the landscape of China well enough to say for sure, though. Yeah. Let's look then now at... The most important part of filming. Yeah. The summer movie draft recap. Oh. This we is have a huge week. A new leader. Bow before your leader. Bow before Justin Robert Young. The Kneel number before one Young. Player. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Justin Robert Young. Now, is this correct? He has had all of his movies play now. Yeah. Uh, yes, he okay. is out. He so is. he he ends on top, four hundred six million dollars. Uh, but he can never make. Well, he can make another dollar because they some of the movies are still in theaters. But he can never make a big splash. He doesn't have another big, uh, release coming. Sarah Lane, four hundred one million dollars, still has Harry Potter yet to come. She's uh, yeah. Well, everybody knows that Harry Potter won't make a single dime, and yeah. that the change up will actually cost the studio's money they'll have a negative they'll actually pay people to come see the movie so i think it's pretty clear who the big winner is going to be it's deathly gonna be hallows is going to be in 3d so not <laughs> yeah, only is right. it not only is it the last harry potter movie but they're putting it out in 3d it's getting good press for its 3d a lot of people are saying hey this looks like it might be worth it in 3d so it's not only going to be making huge amounts of money because people want to see the last harry potter movie but it will also make extra money because it's going to have 3d showings you know, I didn't even think about that when I was looking at the analysis beforehand because I went and I looked at the comps. Almost every I single Harry Potter I don't think they had announced movie. it was going to be in 3D back then. I don't remember whether they had or not. Oh, maybe so. Yeah, that could be because when I looked at the comps, like almost every single Harry Potter movie made $300 million plus or minus $10 million like clockwork. Yeah. And uh, But if I had thought about the 3D thing in advance, not only is it you figure it's going to bump because it's the last one. You figure, and, and but a much bigger bump. I'm going to say this might be a $400 million movie now, now that I look at it. Everybody is now in the pool after this last weekend. Cargill uh, was our last player without a movie that had played. Green Lantern premiered Father's Day weekend, and man, was I wrong. I thought it was going to do well because Father's Day weekend and all the hype, $58 million. I mean, it it's not well, horrible, but at least, but, but at least, at least it was, it was, if not a commercial success, at least it was pure comic book gold. At least they really pleased all the fans of the show with the hard hitting. Uh, Brian, I, awesome. I think people are kind of pissed about this. Uh, it was getting really bad reviews. And 
Oh. Folks didn't really like it much. That didn't work out so hot then. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though. Cargill, that means that in order to stay in the game or have even a chance at the top, uh, Transformers Dark of the Moon has to be a $400 million movie. And this is something I was And I debating. think it will be, honestly. But, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Here's, here's the thing is, uh, I, I, I mean, I suspect there will be a bit of a lag from how bad Transformers 2 was. Now, Transformers 2 was a big commercial success, but it was so bad that even though, by all reports, Transformers 3 is supposed to be very good, I, I wonder if people are going to be a little bit burnt off uh, from the last movie, and that'll affect sales going forward this But it time. is July 4th weekend. Oh, that's right. No, that'll be big. And I think be... that is a bigger uh, surety than Father's Day weekend was for, <laughs> for Green Lantern. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, now, here's the big question to me. I think it's obvious at this point that Sarah's going to win. Uh, I got to be honest, it's going to be you and me fighting for second place. I don't know. And Cargill's got, uh, got transformers. I think he'll be right in there. I don't know. He's, he's only got $58 million. Now, you don't have left. any movies left either, right? Oh, no, you no, have no, Zookeeper. I got two movies. I got two movies. Oh, Captain America. Okay, yeah. And Zookeeper. And Zookeeper is going to be one of those movies where it's like, whether or not you like it, it's, it's, it's a comedy starring Kevin James. Last time, it, The Grown Ups last year was over $100 million. It was going to be, or, you know, one of those Night at the Museum type things. Paul Blart, all those. They all, you know. They got bankable names, and they're solid comedies that our grandfathers enjoy. Now, don't forget, we have right there in the middle of the pack Jason Howell, our very own producer of Frame Rate, two hundred twenty-one million, and he's got Cars Two this weekend. Yeah, I expect huge things for so Cars Two because I, I heard you guys talking about it earlier. Cars One, obviously not their biggest financial success at the theater, but uh, Cars is the biggest merchandising franchise of all of Disney history, which means that there are kids who have spent their entire lives, all five years of it or whatever, yeah. watching and being programmed by Cars. And when they hear that it's Cars 2, every boy, every kid is going to be like, Cars 2, Cars 2. I, I think there's a really good chance that this could be a blockbuster. Not, I mean, like, uh, unprecedented Pixar success. Not to mention Pixar has yet to really... Like, it, it almost seems like they roll out a movie every summer almost, and you're always anticipating the next one because there really hasn't been a super failure Pixar movie yet. So I'm Never. sure the kids see that a new Pixar movie is coming out, whether they know cars or not, they're going to want to go see it. It's just always a good time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, I, I have not watched any movies since our last recording. Uh, at least uh, not you know, in the I theaters. did. What, what have you got? Well, I went to the Alamo Draft House to watch Super 8, and it was sort of on a whim. It was because, actually, I just done the Weird Things podcast with Andrew Main, and that was his pick. I was like, well, let's go, Bon. So we went to the Alamo Draft House, and as you know from last week's episode, they've got their big – no texting in the theater thing that they're doing. And so I, I tweet out, this is right before the movie, um, I tweet out, you know, hey, at the Alamo Draft House watching Super 8. And then all of a sudden, way loud, my phone goes, choo-choo. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, oh, crap. And I pick it up, and I kid you not, it's an at reply from Larry Fong, the cinematographer of Super 8, who we had on NSFW a few weeks back, saying, don't forget to turn off your phone or they'll kick you out. So uh, was, and he almost gets you kicked out doing it. it. Was, yes, exactly. And I'm watching his movie. It was, it was this most awesome confluence of weirdness in there. But I really liked Super 8. And um, I can understand, uh, people were saying like it was missing a something and they don't know what. And I, I don't know what it is either, but I can see why they would say, oh, well, this isn't the next E.T. or whatever. But, uh, but man, it was, it, was it pretty, and did it touch all the right parts of nostalgia in my body? I mean, it was, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it a lot. And I heard some complaints about the creature design. Uh, I like the creature design. Uh, spoiler alert, mild uh, hot sauce. What are you thinking? Like the yellow, maybe? Yellow. Yellow. Yeah, yellow. Oh, yellow. Spoiler alert, yellow. Uh, the only thing the that I didn't care playing. for was that, uh, was, was that the, the face was a little too anthropomorphized. I would have preferred something a little more alien. But again, you know, when you're making a whole movie about you know, touching people's hearts, you got to make something relatable about the, the creature. Stop touching my heart. <laughs> the nostalgia in my body is mine. You keep your hands off of it, J.J. Abrams. You nostalgia raper. <laughs> <All right. laughs> let's, let's move on quickly to Tube Tops. American Gods, the book, is going to be turned into miniseries, and in fact, they've committed to six seasons of it on HBO, which means you that Neil kidding? Gaiman has to write another book to give them enough material. They, they, they actually committed, committed? Yeah. What? This is, is, this is unprecedented, is it? I mean, can you think of another series I don't series know if it's was... unprecedented for HBO. 
uh, if this were like you know broadcast or cable, you know regular non premium, uh, then yes, I, I think it would be totally unprecedented. HBO may have done this before. I, I just don't know. Well, I'm certain. I'm certain they. Uh, well, and actually, actually, just made news that Game of Thrones got renewed after it launched, right? Yeah. So that means they didn't do that for Game of Thrones. They didn't commit to six seasons. Yeah, this is this is pretty crazy. Neil Gaiman's going to be writing on the show as well. Uh, Io9 has a poll up. Who should be cast as the leads? In American Gods. Now, I don't know all of these folks. Uh, uh, the characters or, no, the, no, or the, the actors? No, no, the actors. But I know enough of them that this is pretty fun to uh, page through. Uh, yeah, and actually, I didn't know if we were going to go through it ourselves, but, uh, but I'm like you. There are too many of these names that I didn't recognize on site, but the ones that I did, I enjoyed seeing in there. And I, to be honest, you know, any of them are going to be fantastic at, at it. I really enjoyed American Gods as the book. Uh, I listened to it on Audible. Uh, it was read by George Guidall. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, I, I got to tell you, though, I liked American Gods a lot, and I really liked uh, Nancy Boys, the, the, not the sequel, but kind of the side novel to it. Um, I don't see how it's going to be as epic or six seasons as Game of Thrones. Like, well, no, and almost- that's why Neil Gaiman is writing another book, because he reali- I think they realize, well, we can't get a full six out of this. So let's let's have some more material. Let's have another story to dig into. It's bad. that's pretty weird to me. But but even the whole uh, let's let's take just American Gods. Do you think they could even get three seasons out of that one book? I yeah yeah I do. I think they could three twelve episode seasons. I think you could. I mean no. uh, the fact that they they squeezed Game of Thrones into twelve felt too rapid. There was no, so no, much no, 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 no. They, they I'll, I'll tell done. you where, where Game of Thrones, and of course we're going to talk about Game of Thrones since the the, the series the season just ended. But uh, but I it was very dense with Game of Thrones. But what they masterfully did was they would condense so many feelings into that would take pages of backstory. No, in I the know, book. I know they did a good job with that stuff. But I, I still think you could have done a twenty four episode season of Game of Thrones, and it would have been just as good. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I think I'm, I'm not. Don't take this as a criticism that they did a bad job. I'm just we saying. Hear you. Just you saying, hated this I'm performance just saying of Game of Thrones. That I despise HBO's Game of Thrones. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. You don't even fight it. I like that about you, Merritt. <laughs> all right. Uh, also, uh, Japanese Nintendo 3DS is going to get 3D TV service uh, with the help of Fuji TV, Nintendo's Itsu. No Mani Terebi, or Spot Pass TV, which is easier for me to say, will bring a number of short format 3D TV programs to the handheld, including shows featuring sumo wrestling, uh, cute animals, daily tips on performing magic tricks. Uh, so it's it's not broadcast 3D, but it's it's getting little 3D TV shows. Maybe this is a better use of 3D for entertainment than I'm, I'm going some, to than I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to make a prediction that this will be the single most wildly successful implementation of 3D TV uh, of all because- Which means it'll be wildly it. used? Uh, no, no, no. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm going to say in the relative scheme of things, it'll be nothing compared to 3D use in the box office, but you have a malleable audience in that they're ma- mainly youngsters. You have glasses free and you have a ubiquitous automatically 3D implemented item. Uh, I'm going to say this is as sweet as it gets for 3D. And I'm going to say that a year from now, two years from now, people are going to be like, 3D is dead, except for on the 3DS, where it's incredibly popular. Yeah. I don't think, it'll, I don't think anybody will ever say it's dead, but I think they may say, this is the only place where 3D entertainment is actually doing any kind of good stuff. It's been doing gangbusters in movie theaters. You, get, you have to admit that. Yes. It, and, it may and be that are people are starting to... to catch on and not wanting to do it anymore, but. Right. Well, and and I think also I think people are figuring out what kind of movies people respond to in 3D and which ones they don't. I mean, it wasn't like Goldberg's Travels in 3D. Like, what was that about? Yeah, the, that the, been, almost everything has been in 3D. I mean, Driving yeah. Miss Daisy. And, uh, I don't really need. That's to right. <laughs> <laughs> the steering wheel. His sorrow. It's in 3D. That's, I can feel like I can reach out and wipe out away. Of, <laughs> a tear fell out of the screen on my eye. All right. Uh, TV shows, lots of uh, summer uh, movie, uh, summer uh, launches happening. In fact, July 11th is the big day for sci-fi. That's when Alpha premieres. Uh, that's when Eureka is supposed to come back. Haven is going to be launching later that week. So all the sci-fi stuff gets replaced. Uh, Sanctuary just had its uh, mid-season finale, so it's off. It's off now after they after a cliffhanger. 
But yeah, I thought the third season of Sanctuary was just fine. I like Sanctuary, and it was just fine. It's not something I think everybody has to watch. Uh, Outcasts premiered on BBC America, an original for BBC America, uh, set where the people are fleeing a destroyed Earth, and uh, very few folks have made it to a planet called Carpathia. Lots of little intrigue and stuff. I was impressed. I actually, I, w I just watched it on a whim. I wasn't that excited about it, and I, I think that is one to keep an eye on. One, and I, instead of watching Falling Skies, I watched Outcast. Falling Skies is the Spielberg TNT show uh, wait, so you, you that is also even... post-apocalyptic Earth. You, you, wait, so did you ever watch Falling Skies, or you did not? I did not. I watched Outcast instead. I, I turned on Outcast thinking, I'm going to watch Falling Skies, but... Let me just watch a few minutes of this to get the flavor of it. And I got sucked in and watched the entire episode. And then I was like, oh, I don't have time to watch Falling Skies now. I'm going to bed. Okay, so both, both are sci-fi. Falling Skies is what? We're occupied. And, uh, yeah. and Outcast is we run away to a different planet. Yeah, and Falling Skies is not getting great reviews either. Uh, you know what? Uh, Patrick DeLahanty is very into this kind of thing. And just before, he asked if I saw it. Uh, and I, you know, I've been on the road. And he was just like, eh. yeah. He's not, not optimistic about so I'm it. I'm telling you, if you're looking for a post apocalyptic apocalyptic uh, feel go to outcasts and on bbc america it's it replaced doctor who on saturdays uh now that doctor who is in its mid-season break as well uh, but well let, and let's, let's thankfully we know we know there was nothing else really worth watching this entire week right i mean there's nothing wait what what are you talking about wait i mean was there any other shows besides uh what uh, falling skies well, yeah. outcasts so you think you can dance is now like really close to the you know the finals we're starting to get oh the... yeah no that'd be good in fact i'll bet the final so you yeah. think you can dance would be a really big deal yeah no i mean other than that i can't think of anything else America's all right well best let's dance a sponsor route. maybe or or should we should we should go to the sponsor yeah let's you know go to the sponsor do? Yeah. We should go to spoiler alert freaking red and talk about Game of Thrones. <laughs> because spoiler alert. We need to have red flashing lights in the new studio for that. <laughs> That's, yes. Oh, that, that would, would be, be awesome. Red. You'd hook him up to a USB switch, he presses one button, and everything just goes red all at oh, once. Man. If you have that not read the book Game of Thrones, stop your podcast right now. And if, if you, you have not read the book, and you haven't seen the final episode of Game of Thrones, stop your podcast right now. If you should only watch this if you've watched all the episodes of Game of Thrones on HBO, or if you've read the book and you feel like, I'm not really going to be that spoiled about knowing how they did it on the TV show. Otherwise, yeah, no, we, stop. Yeah, we've said that before. It's not really a spoiler if, uh, if you've already know the story, if you've read the book. But the yeah. implementation, uh, look, from beginning to end, without doubt, HBO absolutely bat 1,000 on this series. Like, when, when my only gripe is, well, I thought that plot point came out in the future book. I mean, it was nailed, the emotions of it. Uh, I cannot believe they condensed so big, so sweeping a story in there with such surprises. Uh, they, they just nailed it. Just nailed it. From beginning to end, uh, it has been pitch perfect. Uh, in fact, some of my earlier concerns, like, I, I didn't really like the way they were portraying Catherine. Uh, uh, in the first few episodes, and now that she had that character has come into her own, and maybe it was just because I knew this is what she was supposed to be like, and she isn't really like that yet in the early parts. But I thought she was portrayed kind of weakly at first. Not anymore. Now well, we've, we've got her saying, first we get our daughters back, then we kill them all." As soon as she said that line, I was like, "That's Cat. That's my Lady Catherine right there." Uh, you, you know what? I just realized that uh, that we need. We, I'm afraid we need a spoiler alert even higher than red because what I'd like to do is talk about what's going to happen in future books. But I don't even want to do that. I just want to keep it to what we've seen. Well, but we it's did like see a peek into a future book with uh, Joffrey on the on the on the landing with with Sansa. And then we the first time we see Sansa actually resisting him. That is actually in the next book. It's not in yeah, uh, Game of Thrones. Okay, good. So you knew that. And, and then uh, I'll tell you what I really liked was the way they handled that with her having a dark thought. And then just as she moved, having the hound lean in to clean her face as if, you know, he knew. And, well, I'll and tell that's, you, not, that's not from the book. That's a different no, character. Know. But I like this is one of those good choices that you're talking about. They said, you know what? We need to establish her relationship with the hound. We don't have time to go through all the tricks that they do in the book. So let's have him do that because that in that one piece establishes, aha, he cares for her. 
Yes, and, and not in any big way, but in a, look, I have loyalty and I have a job, but I have, you know, no desire to see you hurt beyond that. But again, uh, the entire first book, I thought they did a, a much bigger job of, first of all, they, they paint him as more hideous as, as the Hound and also as an ugly person as well. So you spend the entire first book fearing the Hound and seeing no redeeming qualities about him. But, uh, but then, you know, in the story, they sort of, they make him a little bit more sensitive and they make him more sympathetic in that they tell the story about, uh, him and Gregor Gregor Clegane. Yeah, the, uh, the, mountain. the mountain. Yeah, uh, but and- of course, the the big money shot of the whole thing was the way they handled the end. The one part of the whole book, you spend the whole. It's so weird because you spend the whole time that you go into this being told it's a fantasy story and seeing no fantasies, no fancy anything. Maybe a maybe a, a mysterious alive hand or zombie nod or something like that. Blue but eyes, even, dead oh, coming back to life. Uh, it's pretty fantastical. Yeah, but. Yeah, but, but I mean, that's we see that on The Walking Dead. That ain't fantasy. But And so then this end scene no, that's a when you get MFing dragons, D-double-R-A-G-O-N-S. Now, some people dra- complained that in the book, you actually get to stay with her through the entire night, and it's much more dramatic, and that this sort of fading to black, and then you just open up, and there she are with a few dragons. I totally disagree with those people. I think you had to do it this way. It would have been boring if you stayed with her all through the night. Sure, they might have been able to make an acknowledgement of it with a quick quick look, but the drama for anybody who didn't read the book uh, of seeing her walk into the fire and then cutting to the next morning and seeing the smoking remains, having her stand up with the dragons. Her clothes have burnt off, right? Her hair was actually supposed to be burnt off too. They didn't go that far. Uh, Oh, okay. See, I was wondering that because Bonnie said she remembered that. And by the way, it's hilarious to me how much of the book I've forgotten. I mean, this whole thing has been like the Cliff Notes version of this awesome book I read five years ago. So, So that was in there, that her hair burnt off and then she sort of was born anew, right? Yeah, exactly. This is supposed to be her rising from the ashes, literally and figuratively both. And we get to see the mother effing dragons for the first time. Uh, well, and, and here's the other thing, too. In that scene, when she stands up and everybody is absolutely stunned and they just bow in sheer awe of her as a person, uh, how different is that character? That's when you realize this entire time you thought you were watching a show about Sean Bean. You're watching the show about the transformation of a young, abused little sister into something completely oh, yeah. fundamentally this different. Show is, well, this show is this entire series, and we're in spoiler alert level red, but I'm even going to go redder. Uh, this entire reddest. series is, a, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, is about Daenerys and Jon Snow. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And much, uh, much like the first book, you spend a lot of time, you know, enjoying these other characters and you discover that it's not really their story, it's someone else's story. And it just gets bigger and bigger. It's so awesome. Uh, the one thing I missed that, and I don't see any way they could have stuck it in, I really liked the way um, in the books they, they portrayed her future as it was going to be without the call, with the call dead. Like, oh, you go to be part of this group of old crones and, yeah. and nobodies on the side. And, uh, and then, you know, faced with that. But again, I understand that television is a different medium. No complaints. I was really happy with the way they, they did everything. Um, man, I, I guess that's it. And oh, and I think I agree with that, that JPEG everybody's sending around. Just give uh, Tyrion Lannister the Emmy already, right? Oh, Peter, Peter Dinklage. Dinklage, man. Yeah, he has exceeded my expectations. He doesn't look the way I imagine Tyrion, but I have forgotten all about that. He is Tyrion. Like, and, and that's something huge. When, a, when an actor can be so good, he can fundamentally redefine not only the way you picture the character, but the way the author expressly wrote the character and then still make you fall in love with him. That is really something. And I cannot say enough good things about what he did to redefine that character for me. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com. If you think we need a spoiler alert level plaid, for instance, as Pete Delahanty does, you could start spoileralertplaid.squarespace.com right now and get it up and running and looking professional. I mean, that's not even a site that has to look professional, but it would if you use Squarespace. The fast and easy way to create a website or blog. I noticed noticed that it says here squarespace.com code frame rate six. Because we, there, there were no codes for a while. Because it was like you go to the website, you do your free two-week trial, but now you get a code. What does the code do? Okay, so you still get the free trial, and you yep. still don't need a credit card to sign up. So you can do it right now and, and have a website going lickety-split. However, if you decide to keep the service and pay for it, 
Use the offer code FRAMERATE6 and you get 30% off your first three months. I'm sorry, did you, it sounded like you said 30%. I like did one say third off. 30% off your first three months. So that's like almost the same as, as you, you pay for three months, but you pretty much get four. I mean, you get like a secret three month off somewhere in there? Practically speaking, yes. Uh, awesome. Frame okay, rate yes. six is the code. Go to squarespace.com, import your old blog, or start a new one right now. Uh, it's going to look awesome. Uh, check out forecastpodcast.com if you want to see an example of how good a site can look. Or if you need to be making a site for somebody else, use Squarespace. It'll be easy for you, and then you can charge them a lot for your services. Just saying. All right. Squarespace.com, frame rate six. We thank them for their support of frame rate. On now to Interferon. 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 Shoot me up, gentlemen. So we have an email for our Interferon submission today. Yeah, this one comes from Nick Etherton, and he writes, Hey, Frame Rate Gang, and I should uh, disclose that we haven't actually looked at these links. We thought it'd be fun to explore it together. Hey, Frame Rate Gang, Stickleist from the chat room here. Just wanted to point out to you guys the teaser trailers that have been coming out for the new Muppets movie. First, we had this attached to Pirates of the Caribbean, and we'll see that in a moment, followed by two more par movie parody teasers. I won't spoil what the parodies are, just check them out, one and two. I think it's really interesting to see the Muppets make these types of references and use YouTube as a vital part of their marketing strategy for the movie. Personally, I'm loving these, and they feel right at home with the Muppets universe. Just wondering as to what your take was on this. And I do want to check them out, but, but first let me say, you know, the Muppets were always hip. I mean, even when they were not hip, they, they were still hip, especially like in the late 70s. They were all about, you know, adult references. Well, it, it, the earliest uh, Jim Henson work, was these coffee commercials that were like totally edgy with like Muppets shooting each other for not drinking the right coffee and stuff. And, that, and not that we're saying that the Muppets are, are, are edgy so much, but like they've always They're been totally into... violent. <laughs> we're, saying, we're saying that Muppets are gangsters. Muppets is what we're to will say. kill you. <laughs> let's, let's take a look at the, uh, uh, I, I don't know which one you have queued up, Jason. I have all look, three. Look, we look could at. start with the first one, Pirates of the yeah, Caribbean. Yeah, let's, let's hit them up. Hi. Two people searching for love. This is the most romantic thing ever. I've always dreamt of seeing Los Angeles. One chance to go the distance. I was just wondering what the plan was for dinner tonight. Oh, I don't care. What do you feel like? Okay. I'm going to go for a walk. But sometimes... I forgot my anniversary with Mary. You have to break your heart. You know when you've been trying to figure something out and you can't figure it out and you figure it out and you're like, duh. To find its other half. You're my best friend. Jason Siegel. I love Mary. I love her so much and I can't lose her. Amy Adams. I love you too. Kermit the Frog. Hi there. Miss Piggy. Kermit! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Stop. Are there Muppets in this movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. Come on, guys, let's go! The Muppets. Oh. Ow. <laughs> wow, that was an expensive looking explosion. I can't believe we had that in the budget. So I uh, I had seen this one before. I didn't realize this is the one that came out with the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. But uh, but I got suckered in first time I saw it. I was like, this looks like a genuine. Well, it's got Amy movie. Adams in it. So you're like, oh, of course. You know, Amy Adams is going to do a romantic comedy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and plus. But, but, but then, like, you know, I'm not, I usually get swept into trailers and I don't notice when they're poorly executed. But it's like, this sounded like one of those YouTube fan made trailers. It was so, so, so generic and cheesy in its mm -hmm. execution that I was just like, what is this terrible movie? That's such a terrible trailer. And then the Muppets showed up. And I was like, ah, you got me, you bastards. You but I have not seen these other two. Jammy bastards. All right, want to play the second one? Yeah. Here we go. Uh, why is it not playing? This one we go. is a different one. Over the years, they've said. The Xanadu of family entertainment. Absolutely hilarious, sometimes on purpose. I had no idea what they were talking about, Hollywood Reporter. What a bunch of lunatics, This Week Monthly.
It, it, it is de- this one's definitely a visual joke for those of you on the audio podcast. The fuzzy pack is back. The muffins. So this is this is clearly ripping on the Hangover, the Hangover Two, right? Hey guys, the Muppets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm a Muppet. <laughs> That one's not as good for me. Oh, no way. This one's a million times better. This one was no perfect, dude. That one's way better. That one's new well, champion you, as you, far as I'm concerned. You don't, you don't go through it thinking and looking at a movie. You just see a few scenes. They had to, and the Muppets come really quickly. Uh, no, it was, I thought it was way better. All right, let's, let's see the last one, and we will judge for ourselves. In brightest day, in darkest night... No evil shall escape my sight. Let those who laugh at my lack of height beware my banjo, Green Froggy's light. <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys. Uh, something in my throat. We need you. Come on, guys, let's go. Ah! Muppets. It looks like the joke's about to be on them. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were reciting some sort of an important plot point. Wait, 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 stop. Is this another Muppet trailer parody? Why don't we just show a real trailer? I mean, what are we hiding? Did we make the movie in Swedish or something? Now, I like the fact that they acknowledge the, the, the sort of, like, parody trailer premise right. in this one and take it over the top to like mock the most played trailer in all of history the green lantern trailer yes well and in fact i actually thought i thought the first half i was like oh well this is my least favorite of all of them because there's nothing particularly green lantern-y about the footage that we're seeing but uh but it won me over at the end with uh referencing not only the parodical nature of the trailers, but the trailers themselves. Uh, I thought that was good. But second one's still the best. Second one's still the best. First one's still the best. Sorry. All right. All right. Yep. Took me in. Took me in all the way. Saw it in the theater, too. Well, you want to read some other letters? Maybe uh, maybe do a little bit of feedback? Oh, feedback. Now it's time for Feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Well, we started a war in the chat room. Chat room is all kinds of shouting up and down about whether it's the first, second, or third. A lot of people like the third one best. Yeah, it seems like uh, three is winning the chat room, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I tell you what, I got an email here from Paul Meyer. Dear Brian and Tom, I heard you mention the TV show Supernatural a time or two, and I know you are aware of it. Was wondering if either of you have ever tried to watch it. I find it to be an excellent show with very dynamic plot points and fascinating characters. Similar to X-Files, it finds genius ways of mixing humor in with the horror and suspense. Supernatural will be starting its seventh season this fall. Hopefully one or both of you can find some time to give it a try and maybe enjoy it as much as I have. Thanks for the great show, Paul Meyer. Now, I, I actually have not watched a single episode of Supernatural, but I had 8 million people tell me to watch the episode called, I think the title of the episode was Chris Angel's a Douchebag or something like that. Oh, right, uh, because the magic scene. That makes sense. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. But have you watched Supernatural at all? Uh, uh- I, I I remember when Supernatural came on because one of the characters uh, in it was on Smallville. And then the next okay. season, he moved to Supernatural and he left Smallville. And uh, the only other thing I know about Supernatural is at the end of every Smallville for several seasons, they would say, hey, this is Chris coming up next in all new Supernatural. Don't miss it. <laughs> well, okay, so the reason I picked this one is because him challenging us to watch Supernatural reminded me of our Pinky Promise extravaganza for me watching Fringe and you watching Breaking Bad. Now, I, I have been on the road, so I have not started. But if you started, I want to see if we could work out an actual deadline. No, we need to, to. We need to coordinate this much like our 10,000th tweet. Uh, yes, and... we did. We, we tweeted simultaneously. It was a beautiful moment between the two of us. I felt at one with Tom Merritt. Yeah, that was, that, that was you know, go back on your Twitter logs if you want to relive that moment. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think we, I'm not going to start till you start, and, okay. you know, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of time it that way. I tell way, you what, so. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you know when. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, man, it's going to be like The Wire. Once you get started, you're going you're gonna to leave me in the dust. Well, this but is a, but we're getting very close to the time when I watched The Wire last year, uh, so that, that would be good. Awesome. Okay. Well, then I'm going to read the next email. Fine. (laughs) Enough agreeing. Matt in Vienna, Virginia says, I'm not sure I share your enthusiasm for stars movies on Netflix, 
While I agree that some of the best films on Netflix in terms of quality content are usually from stars, I have serious problems with the quality of the stream that Netflix gets from them. Every time I start a movie and see the stars intro, my heart sinks because I know I'm going to get a pretty bad looking film. The bitrate seems lower. I haven't seen an HD stream from them, though I haven't looked hard. Uh, and worst of all, the video is usually altered to fit to 16.9. It's like the days of Pan and Scan, Alice in Wonderland, for example. I adore Netflix, but they need to work on the technical quality of their content. I'm still waiting for surround sound from them. Uh, so he starts to kind of veer off into, into other issues. Sounds like a video file, which I am not. But I've heard this before, that people say, wow, stuff on Netflix looks great, except when it comes from stars. It seems like they're getting a lower quality bit rate. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'd hate to. I, I am the last person to complain. You know, I'm always saying convenience over fidelity, but I, I do notice, especially just the star's intro itself, it looks like it was taken off of a VHS tape and may have actually been, and that may be the nature of what they're able to get with their agreement with Netflix. I, I don't know. Have you noticed I, it at all? I, I, I just, just real quick, I think what happens, it's the same thing that happens with Skype sometimes, is that in the beginning, it's buffering just to get started, and then it kind of irons itself out, because I've noticed that on the Stars intro as well. It's almost always fuzzy, and I think that the video is going to follow that, and maybe it does immediately, but then eventually it kind of clears up a little bit more. So I think maybe it's just buffering it out. That's but I don't know that for yeah, sure. And I do. Usually about uh, 20 minutes in, all of a sudden it'll pause and say, hey, your signal quality has changed. And then all of a sudden it looks like it's in HD. Yeah, it would be nicer if it started that way yeah. instead of 20 minutes in. Though. But then again, I mean, I mean, we say that like there's, there's what consumers think they want. Like what we think we want is for it to always be HD. But uh, it may be that they tested and say, you know what? People get ticked off if the movie for our instant streaming takes 30 seconds to buffer. Oh, they absolutely do. So, you know, everybody's going to complain about something. Yeah. I just, I want it to start immediately and be perfect from the beginning. Yeah, I don't think that's too much to ask. All I want is to watch anything I want in the topmost quality, instantaneous, at a reasonable fee. And by reasonable, I mean pretty free. much free. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's And I want to be in the movies I watch. Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, I would love it if they had some software that would write algorithms to where in various movies, whether it's a romantic comedy or an action movie, they mention my name yeah. throughout the thing. They're like, this will affect Brian Brushwood's <laughs> ability to watch movies. You know, True Blood did that as, well, as a promotion because True Blood's going to restart here uh, very no soon. Way. And what did they, do? They, did a, they did a viral video where you would put in your, your Facebook account and it would take your name and the name of several of your Facebook friends. Was it Facebook or Twitter? If Eileen's still here, she'll tell me. Uh, but, but then they would work it into printed stuff. Not, they, the characters wouldn't actually speak your name, but they would be saying like, oh, hold on, I just got an email. And it would be from, you know, your, your sister or, or something. That's awesome. They so would it did that thing where like it maps, it maps yeah, the yeah. text onto a screen or totally. something like that? That's awesome. Yep. Are, you still, are you still watching True Blood? I know that's Yeah, that's I love True what... Blood. It's great. It just, yeah? it's been, yeah, it, it's the se new season is starting shortly. Well, I, well, I know this because boy has HBO promoted the ever loving hell out of it. In fact, my DVR started recording Game of Thrones right on the dot. And I got like six minutes of previews. Like they knew Bail. the whole world was watching yeah, totally. the end of Game of Thrones. Uh, and, and they know people are excited about True Blood. I mean, I started the Game of Thrones. Eileen was just coming in from the kitchen and she was like, rewind that. I have to see the preview. <laughs> so that's awesome all right that's it for this edition of frame rate frame rate show at gmail.com is our email address please do send us email we love getting them uh we read every single one of them and we hold them close to our hearts like a teddy bear every night <laughs>